So once again, welcome everybody tonight for our Nature Speaks. We want to welcome back Dr. Allison Sosodote Valet. She's the curator of herpetology at the Chicago Academy of Sciences, Peggy Notabert Nature Museum. And tonight we're going to learn about the direct effects of invasive buckthorn on amphibian survival and development and learn how to get rid of that buckthorn. So welcome, Allison. Oh, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? All right. Um, so tonight, I, I first want to start off by thanking you all for the invitation to speak. It's great to be back here with Prospect Heights Natural Resource Management Commission. Um, and I also want to let everyone know that uh, Chicago Academy of Sciences, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum is now reopened fully um, on a, a daily basis. So please, uh, please come back and uh, check us out. We'd love to see everybody back. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about some research that I did uh, during my graduate work. And this work focused on examining the effects of habitat restoration on amphibian uh, community diversity as well as abundance. So give you a little bit of background. Uh, European buckthorn is a non-native invasive woody shrub and its Latin name is Ramnus cathartica. And buckthorn is native to Eurasia. However, it was introduced in around 1800 to 1820s in Northern Illinois. And it rapidly became naturalized throughout the upper Midwest, Northeastern US, and the maritime provinces of Canada. Now, initially this plant was um, introduced as a hedgerow and it was planted along fence lines marking farm fields and it was put in place uh, for several reasons. Uh, one reason was that it was thought to provide mast or food for wildlife, but uh, as we'll talk about tonight, many species can't eat this as a source of food. Um, and because it has allelopathic properties, these are properties that inhibit the growth of competing plants, it very quickly established. So in our woodlands that have been invaded by buckthorn, you can actually go back and see where the larger stems are often in a straight line where they were planted marking where there was once a farm field and it very rapidly proliferated and spread out from there. Now, because it can inhibit these other competing plants, it tends to form these really dense brushy thickets and it's very difficult for humans to move through and it's difficult for wildlife to move through as well. Um, buckthorn is generally considered to be an upland species, but there had been some research um, back around 2007 that found that there seems to be a Midwestern ecotype of buckthorn that grows more opportunistically around soils that are more waterlogged. So these soils are what we tend to find around amphibian breeding sites like vernal pools. So amphibians are, are early pond breeding amphibians like uh, blue spotted salamanders and chorus frogs and spring peepers. They will only breed in temporary bodies of water that are free of fish because the fish will feed on their eggs and their larvae. And if it's a large enough species of fish, they'll feed on the frogs or salamanders directly. So they have to breed in these temporary pools in order to avoid a lot of predation. But that means that they have to complete their entire development cycle before those ponds dry up. So there are several properties of European buckthorn um, that really make it uh, an excellent invader. And some of those have to do with the timing of when the plant produces leaves and how long it retains its leaves. So buckthorn, if you, if you go into one of the Northern Illinois woodlands that does have buckthorn, which is a lot of them, um, usually around March, it looks fairly gray. Most of the plants have not leafed out yet, but when you see shrubs with little bits of green early on, that's going to be buckthorn almost inevitably. It is producing leaves 
earlier than our native shrubs. So not only does it kind of get a jump start on blocking light out to other competing plants, but it retains its leaves on average about 56 days longer than our native species. So that effectively shades out a lot of the ground cover and keeps other plants from really establishing or trying to kind of get, get a foothold and compete with buckthorn. As it shades out ground cover, it produces its own leaf litter at the end of the year, and that leaf litter breaks down very quickly, more rapidly than most of our native litter from oak trees or hickory trees um, or even maples. And because of that, we end up with woodlands that look like the picture in the lower photo where you just see this bare soil in these dense thickets and it looks really dark and almost uh, desert-like. There's really no cover. And as it's dropping the leaves and as those leaves are breaking down, it actually has a very high nitrogen content to its leaves. So it's nitrifying the soil further and changing the carbon nitrogen ratio in the soil. So as it changes the carbon nitrogen ratio, it's basically improving conditions for its own growth and making it harder for competing species to establish. This changes the soil microbial community. It actually facilitates earthworms moving into these sites. And um, most of the earthworms in our area are not native either. Um, and it also um, supports several hosts uh, or several pest species, excuse me, like soybean aphids um, that can affect crops as well. But what we're particularly interested in are the effects, the ecological effects and uh, direct survival effects on amphibians. So when we talk about the potential ecological effects on amphibians, a lot of these are going to be indirect effects. There are impacts to the species that are kind of happening in this circuitous way. So um, one of the, the main indirect effects we see is the hydrological impact on the breeding pools. So as I mentioned, amphibians are breeding in these shallow temporary ponds, unless it's a bullfrog or a green frog, which tend to use permanent lakes and ponds. Um, but what we have are these situations like in this upper photo where we see a vernal pool that's completely ringed by buckthorn. And you you can kind of see that wall of buckthorn in the, in the back of the photo uh, at the far end of the pond. And you'll notice that that pond is dry. So there had been some work um, in 2000 or 2001 showing that buckthorn takes up more, more water from the soil than our native shrubs do. And so when it grows in these dense thickets, it actually kind of siphons up the water from the pond and from the soil surrounding the pond, and it shortens the, am the amount of time that these ponds hold water. And so that's called the pond hydro period. And so this photo was taken in May and um, this, not of this year, this was a drought year. So most of our ponds look like this this year, but um, this was in a wetter year. And for context, um, species like the blue spotted salamander in the lower photo, their larvae don't typically complete metamorphosis until early July. So if this is what's happening, there is this impact on their survival because they're not going to be able to hatch have their larvae develop, go through metamorphosis and make it back into the upland habitat in time. Now, one of the other things that happens is as we have that kind of bare soil, um, almost desert-like condition created under the buckthorn thicket, there's no ground cover, there's very little leaf litter left, um, that's going to interrupt the interpond movements for amphibians. So amphibians spend about, or our forest amphibians spend about 90% of their life actually underground. They come out in spring to breed, migrate to these vernal pools, they lay their eggs, they'll spend some time feeding in those ponds, and then they're gonna wait for another rain in spring and move out of the pond back into the surrounding forest. So in order to do that, they have to cross whatever habitat is between their burrow and the pond. And that's usually going to be some woodlands, but um, amphibians respire through their skin and it's a source of water gain, but it's also a source of water loss 
And so they rely on the presence of that leaf litter and that ground cover to keep them from desiccating and losing all of, all of the water from their body to the environment. So that desiccation is a real threat and its impact is basically happening through that, um, that loss of the leaf litter and loss of the ground cover from competition with buckthorn and from changes in um, carbon nitrogen ratio from buckthorn. Additionally, we have an alteration in their prey base. Amphibians tend to feed on a lot of soil arthropods. And when buckthorn moves in and when it drops its, its litter, some of uh, the research by Liam Henahan from DePaul University showed that the buckthorn litter can actually cause some boom bust cycles in soil arthropod populations. So they'll move into an area where there's litter and kind of form this, this dense patch of arthropods and then it breaks down very quickly and their food source is depleted. And so they're gone. And again, the amphibians are feeding on those soil arthropods. So when we lose that, that's part of their subsistence. That's part of their diet. Um, another effect, an indirect effect on amphibians is a limitation in their overwintering habitat because where we have really dense thickets of buckthorn, and even when we have older established stands of buckthorn that have been there for decades and decades, we have lower small mammal density. So we did some um, small mammal surveys and trapping uh, when I was in graduate school, comparing patches of invaded stands versus uh, areas where buckthorn had been cleared. And there was very strong difference in population size and diversity of small mammals where it was much more, uh, they were much more abundant, much more diverse community of small mammals in areas where buckthorn had been cleared. And we caught about two white-footed mice in the old established buckthorn patch and we caught maybe five mice and three chipmunks in the, the kind of thicket of uh, younger sprouts. Now that matters to amphibians because salamanders use small mammal burrows in order to overwinter. So when you have less small mammals in an area, you're going to have less overwintering burrows for salamanders. So that is another indirect effect. But um, the focus of this project specifically had more to do with the developmental impact of European buckthorn on amphibians and specifically the role of a compound, a metabolite that's produced throughout the tissue of the plants. So this compound is called Imodan and its chemical name is 6-methyl-138-trihydroxyanthroquinone. And um, the structure is there if you're really into anthroquinone structures. Um, this compound has a number of bioactive properties that have been studied um, for a variety of reasons, often um, investigations into kind of um, properties of different homeopathic compounds. Um, but what we know is that Imodin is an uh, herbivory deterrent. So it is distasteful to many small mammals and to many birds. So the thought is that the plant is producing this to ward off potential predators that are gonna gnaw on the leaves and feed on the fruit before the fruit is ripe and before the seed is ready so that it's, it's not effectively dispersed. Um, it's also the putative compound that, that inhibits growth in other competing plants. Um, we also know from some literature with uh, small mammals that it interrupts glycogen metabolism and can actually cause abortive effects in pregnant rodents if they ingest it. Uh, it causes DNA damage in microbes and it's a known purgative so people take it um, to actually induce vomiting or sometimes as an herbal laxative. And, um, it actually can cause human cell death, uh, cellular apoptosis. And so some people take a, another form of it called aloemodin, which is derived from sea buckthorn. And they take that as a cancer preventative because the thought is that it would help destroy tumor cells. But much of this has never been thoroughly evaluated by pharmaceutical studies and uh, pharmacokinetic studies. Um, but we do know that it has these very strong effects. It does affect cell development. It does affect reproductive development. Um, and it also is known to cause neurological disorders when it's ingested by horses and goats. And that actually came from um, a University of Illinois veterinary study uh, a number of years ago where there were 
you know, some horses and goats in a pasture and there was buckthorn growing alongside it. And these animals in this, in this yard happened to feed on it and developed this neurological disorder. Um, further, there have been recent studies showing um, that it can actually bioaccumulate in colon cells when it's ingested and that that study was done um, to evaluate its uh, efficacy as an herbal laxative, but they used zebrafish embryos to test that. Now that study was just from a couple of years ago. So because of the abortive effects in mammals and the DNA damage, um, there seemed to be a lot of potential for this compound to cause um, developmental harm in the amphibian breeding environment. When I first began my, my research on um, habitat restoration and effects of removing invasives on amphibian communities, I was really surprised to see there, there was so little information about this plant that is everywhere in Chicago's woodlands. So um, I especially became concerned as I read about some of these properties that how close it is growing to the amphibian breeding sites. And as um, a putative allelopathic compound, this is something that would be exuded by the roots of the plant. Um, but in buckthorn, it's actually found in the leaves and the fruit and the bark, as well as the roots. So it is producing this compound throughout the tissues of the plant. So we um, really felt that it was worth evaluating um, how, how much of this compound might be in the vernal pool breeding environment, um, whether it was in the soil, whether it was in the water. And then um, with my graduate advisor, Richard King, um, we set out to examine whether there was a developmental impact on amphibians. So to do that, we used a standard ecotoxicological assay called FETAX, which stands for Frog Embryo Teratogenesis Assay with Xenopus. And Xenopus is the, Afri the African clawed frog. And um, African clawed frogs have been used as a model organism to study endocrine disruption and a lot of other um, toxicological studies. Um, one of the reasons uh, people tend to use them for excuse me, ecotoxicological studies is because um, you can induce them to breed any time of year and their embryos take 96 hours to develop. So in the course of a four day window, you can do this assay to see whether or not they develop normally or whether teratogenesis or disruption of development occurs. Um, so we first set out to see if there was any effect with the model organism. And we figured, okay, if we don't see an effect, We'll, we'll stop there, but um, if we do see an effect, we then wanted to test it with a native species that is existing in the invaded range of buckthorn. And to do that, we modified the protocol a little bit and used uh, Sudacris maculata, the boreal chorus frog, which is one of the most common species in our Chicago region, but in our area, we also have a lot of sites, a lot of study ponds um, where people will monitor frogs and you might hear them calling, but then you don't really see recruitment. And there can be a number of reasons why frog eggs might hatch. It may have to do with dissolved oxygen levels. It may have to do with salinity, but we're also interested to learn whether or not this may be an additional threat if there is developmental harm to their developing eggs in the vernal pool environment. So to do this, we set out to try to extract and quantify how much emodin was in the plant tissues and then in the breeding pond environment. So we used high performance liquid chromatography and um, we, we basically purchased a standard of the compound emodin from Sigma Chemicals so that we know exactly what we're looking for when we take samples from the environment and try to see, is this compound here? We have a basis for comparison. And using this, this pure derived form from Sigma, we're able to set up a gradient so we can measure out different amounts and um, set up basically a way to see how much we have coming off when we apply chromatography to our samples from uh, plant tissue and from soil and water. So to do that, we soak buckthorn leaves and fruit in methanol um, and 
we stir that, rotoevaporate it, dry it down, and you basically end up with a concentrate, a precipitate, and you resuspend that in alcohol and methanol. And then you're going to run that back through um, with chromatography and it will pick up the concentration of the compound from your, your given sample. And so one of the, um, the known kind of factors with buckthorn from a lot of the, the previous phytochemistry literature focused on this plant is that the concentrations are greatest um, early in the season and then they taper off in fall. So when the plant is first leafing out, it's going to have greater concentrations than when the leaves are about to senesce. Similarly, when the plant first produces fruit, the fruit is green, it's not ripe yet, the seed is not ready yet, so it's going to have greater concentrations of emodin as an herbivory, excuse me, <laughs> an herbivory deterrent, and then that's going to taper as the fruit becomes ripe. So right about now, this time of year, you may see a lot of these berries on the buckthorn around you, and you will see a few species that will feed on it, like robins, um, Robins do seem to be able to feed on it to an extent without it causing severe harm, but with many other species of birds that have been examined, um, they either completely avoid it or in um, feeding trials uh, that were done in the 70s uh, by Sherburn at Cornell, um, he actually coated preferred fruits of certain birds uh, like rose hips with this compound and tried to feed it to them. They avoided it, um, but he actually force fed some of them. And in those cases, it caused purgative effects and made the birds sick. Um, so we know that this is a compound intended to keep things from, keep different species from feeding on the leaves or the fruit until it's ready. So the next step then was to try to quantify how much of this compound might be in the soils around amphibian breeding ponds. And to do that, we had to figure out what uh, different solvents work, how we were going to extract this compound. And so we spiked clean samples of sand with known concentrations of emodin and tested different solvents. So we tested methanol, hexane, pentane, and benzene. And benzene was the only effective solvent, but it only recovered about 20% of the sample. So emodin binds very strongly to the substrate, to the soils. And so even though we were able to pull off some of it with benzene, that's only giving us about 20% recovery rate. So the estimates that I'm going to show you from what we found in the soils and the breeding ponds are again, going to be a low estimate of what is likely there. Um, the challenge in sampling these soils is that emodin is going to bind differently to more clay rich soils versus more sandy soils versus uh, soils that are more loam. And in our breeding ponds, it's largely clay. And so that's an even stronger bond. So our estimates of how much is there is, is probably even lower than 20%, but it gives us at least a framework to, to examine when we do our ecotoxicological assay. So to get the samples, we first focused on collecting field samples of soils directly beneath buckthorn plants. Then uh, we extracted the emodin with benzene, resuspended that precipitate and methanol and applied chromatography to see how much there was. The next phase that we wanted to look at was how much was in uh, the pond water. So we wanted to compare breeding ponds um, that had buckthorn to breeding ponds that uh, had buckthorn removed. And so we collected these samples back in uh, 2011 um, from breeding sites in Lake County, Illinois. And samples were taken from random points on the northern and southern ends of the pond. And we focused on collecting these water samples from within two meters of the shoreline because that that tends to be where amphibians lay their eggs. It's where there's more uh, submerged and emergent vegetation providing structure for their egg laying. And it's also closer to where the buckthorn sprouts tend to grow very densely. So this is going to be the area that would have more exposure than say 
the center of, um, of a breeding pool. So our first pond was still surrounded by buckthorn sprouts at the time of sampling, and our second pond had been mechanically cleared and then subsequently herbicided um, two years earlier. So two years have gone by, we want to see if we still pick up this compound at all. The next phase of um, our, our examination of ecosystem transport and detection of emodin focused on other potential ways the compound may be getting into the breeding pond environment. And so one potential um, source would be stem flow. And stem flow is what we call the water that comes from um, rainfall moving through the canopy of the shrub down the stem and then out into um, the environment, either infiltrating into the soil or running off to um, a low-lying area. And to collect stem flow, we basically made gutters out of uh, kind of tubing and wrapped it around the trees. Um, and we had to hook that into buckets, wait for rain events and collect these rainwater samples to see if any emodin was coming off in stem flow. Then we took soil samples radiating out from the mature buckthorn stem going toward the breeding ponds. And so we basically took these samples every two meters. And finally, we sampled hydric soil. So this is waterlogged, clay-rich soil right at the edge of the breeding pond um, where there are high densities of buckthorn sprouts in, in um, really kind of strong proliferation where it's really trying to establish a thicket. Um, so the next experiment we did was to try to simulate pond leaching. So we took about 25 grams of dry buckthorn litter and placed that in beakers of one liter of distilled water. We had a few replicates of that. And then every 24 hours, we took a sample of that water and then quantified how much emodin was present to see how much is leaching off in the course of about a week if the buckthorn leaves fall into water. So we use chromatography to quantify uh, the emodin in all of these samples. And here you see um, a very uh, young undergraduate, Wes Glisson, oops, um, who now I believe is at Chicago Botanic Gardens um, following his master's work, but he was really helpful with a lot of the soil work and um, uh, extraction work that we did um, back several years back. Um, so in terms of quantifying how much of this compound was present in the environment, we did find it in varying concentrations around the breeding pools. So we detected emodin in soils radiating out from mature stems into the seasonal basin. So right at the mature stem, right at the base of buckthorn, it was about 0.2 parts per million. As we move further away from the stem, two meters out to right about where the root system might end, it was at um, 0.3 parts per million. So it actually increased slightly at the edges where the roots were, which would make sense if it's an allelopathic compound that it would be exuded from the roots and trying to inhibit growth of other plants. Um, beyond that point though, we weren't picking it up. So at four through 10 meters, we did not detect um, any uh, quantities, at least using our, our um, detection level for our chromatography equipment. Um, we were not able to detect emodin in those stem flow samples, those samples moving from the canopy down the stem. And it could be that the rain events were too flashy, kind of too sudden, um, and rather, rather than like a slow drizzle that might allow for more accumulation of a compound. Um, but it could also just be that the concentrations in the bark and the stem of the tree are much lower than what we find in, um, in the leaves and in the roots and fruit. We detected emodin in the leachate samples where we put the dry leaves into just distilled water. And after 24 hours, it was 0.6 parts per million. Over time though, those concentrations did decrease. They dropped to 0.2 parts per million at 48 hours, stayed at that concentration for se uh, until 72 hours. But then beyond that point, it dropped down to about 0.1 parts per million at 96 hours. And then it was undetected after a week. And at this point, we're not sure what happened, if it completely um, disintegrated um, or if it was metabolized by 
microbes growing on the surface of the leaves because the leaves were collected from, um, from the forest floor. So we're not sure of the fate of the compound at that point in time, but we know that after 24 hours, there is this 0.6 parts per million that comes off into the pond or into um, whatever um, concentration of water you're, you're looking at at that point in time. So again, under the mature stem, right at the base of the mature buckthorn, we had 0.2 parts per million. And at the roots, we had 0.3 parts per million. Now, when we looked at the concentrations of this compound beneath the sprouts in the clay-rich hydric soil, it was two parts per million. So much stronger concentration per soil sample. Um, our water samples from the cleared and um, invaded ponds did not significantly differ in concentrations. They both had fairly low concentrations, but emodin was still detectable. So in the cleared pond, it was 0 0.004 parts per million um, versus the invaded pond that was 0 0.017 parts per million. So we're still detecting this compound in the pond water even two years after clearing, which likely is indicating that the compound is binding to the soil and the pond substrate. So the water is not staying there the whole time because this is an ephemeral pool. It's drying down each season. So it had to go through at least two drawdowns and refilling episodes. Um, and some of these ponds refill multiple times throughout the season if it's a, if it's a kind of flashy year in terms of rainfall. So we see that it is persisting to a degree in that pond substrate. So I know I threw a lot of numbers at you and I'm much more of a visual person. Um, so you can excuse my crude um, attempt at like a textbook diagram of what um, emodin in the environment looks like, but these are the different kind of pools of where um, emodin would come into the environment and where the exposure would vary. And so uh, you see, we don't have anything coming off in the stem flow coming down um, the little shrub, but again, right at that base, it's 0.2. As you move toward the roots, it's 0.3. In that hydric soil surrounding the vernal pond, it's two parts per million. Again, lower concentrations in pond water, but it's still there. And we are having um, some more released in leachates if the leaf litter falls into pond water. Now I drew some amphibian eggs in here uh, to provide a little more context on uh, the right hand side of the little pond. You see these kind of ovals at the, at the bottom. So um, spotted salamanders, tiger salamanders tend to lay their eggs really close to the pond substrate, um, usually on submerged twigs and vegetation um, to anchor them, but they're usually in pretty close contact with the pond substrate versus some of the other species like the chorus frog, which is going to lay its eggs closer to the air water interface, which may be further away from a source of exposure. And that's something we'll come back to and keep in mind. Now, we looked at, um, and we talked a little bit about our ecotoxicology assay, um, the FETAX with the uh, African clawed frog. And so these are African clawed frogs um, at the bottom of the slide. And um, on the right hand side, we see a chart of their normal development. So this is what their developing eggs look like following fertilization. So the bottom right hand photo is going to be a fully developed normal embryo still prior to hatching. This is all just within 96 hours of fertilization. So we use two pairs of African clawed frogs um, to breed eggs for this, this assay. And um, we set up nine experimental treatments with between eight and 13 replicates. So because we had two different breeding pairs, they produced different numbers of eggs, which is why we have different numbers of replicates. And each breeding pair is examined kind of as a separate block. So we could see if there's an effect of one breeding pair versus another. Does one pair's offspring respond and the other one is not sensitive to the compound? Um, so that's why we need multiple breeding pairs for this type of assay. Within each of our replicates, we had 20 individual um, frog embryos per um, experimental uh, 
treatment. And so we had nine treatments. So the first was our negative control. So this is um, something that's supposed to produce normal development. So we shouldn't see any um, issue with development or any malformation. And uh, for the negative control, we use a solution called Ringer solution, which is uh, essentially like a physiological saline for amphibians. Um, then we are going to use a low positive control. So this is um, uh, exposure to a substance that is a known teratogen. It's going to cause some degree of disruption to normal uh, egg development. And so it should induce some malformation at low concentrations. So for this, we use 5.5 parts per million, six amino nicotinamide, and this is niacin. And so niacin can cause human birth defects. This is one of the reasons it was studied with African clawed frogs in the regions uh, um, in, in the first place. And so this is um, our basically standard low positive control for, um, for the FETAX assay. And then the high positive control is 2,500 parts per million, six amino nicotinamide. And that should basically stop development right away. So in that treatment, it's complete teratogenesis. They do not develop beyond fertilization. Then we looked at emoting concentrations and we we're trying to kind of flank the values that we found in the environment and build a gradient because we know that we're only recovering 20% or even less with the clay soil of what was actually there. So we looked at concentrations of 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 110, 10, 50, and 100 parts per million. So the next step of this project was to actually get the frogs to breed, which you do with a hormone injection. Um, that's the standard protocol for this assay. And once um, they're given a hormone injection, um, they will amplex, which is the breeding embrace, um, the male uh, grasping the female in the photo. And um, in the lower photo, you can see what look almost like poppy seeds. Those are thousands and thousands and thousands of um, tiny little eggs. So um, after they're done breeding, we individually check every embryo to ensure that they are fertilized and that they are developing normally and then assign them to a treatment randomly. So this is a lot of work with the dissecting scope going through these tiny little eggs. Um, and we check that each of these treatments every 24 hours, the course of 96 hours to see if there's any mortality. If there is, we remove those embryos. We replace the fluids, the different concentrations of each treatment every 24 hours. And at the conclusion of the experiment, we preserve um, the, the embryos that are left in formalin so that we can score them um, to determine um, the number of malformations per embryo and the type of malformations that we're seeing. And we also determine the overall percent mortality for each plate and for each treatment. And so for the modification of this assay with the boreal chorus frog, we collected eggs from the field rather than doing any captive breeding of them. Um, we found four amplexed pairs. So these are amplexed pairs of chorus frogs in this photo um, that were about to lay eggs and temporarily place them in a bucket. And we only collected about 10% of the eggs that we that they produce because we didn't want to have a severe impact to one of our native species. So we put the rest of the eggs back in the habitat with the frogs, but we had um, basically four pairs, so four breeding blocks that we would um, look for and, um, and uh, score to make sure that those embryos were normally developed. So we then set them into those same nine experimental treatments, the negative control, low positive and high positive control, and then the 0.1.5, um, 10 and 100 and, um, I'm sorry, I skipped 50 and 50 parts per million of emodin to see what the exposure um, would produce. So I'm um, just gonna drag a little thumbnail out of the way here so I can um, kind of point to the graph for you. 
So these are the results of our mortality study with the African clawed frog embryos. So what we're seeing is that there is a significant positive effect of, um, more, of emodin concentration on uh, African clawed frog egg mortality. So as they're increasingly uh, um, increasing in concentrations, um, we're seeing greater and greater proportion of malformation, greater probability that um, those eggs will not survive. So here, we're seeing one block, and I don't know if you can really see my mouse. So um, the solid line in the figure um, representing uh, block two with the black circles is one breeding pair, and the dotted line um, kind of further to the right in the figure with the open circles is block one. So these are the two breeding pairs. These are their offspring. And so what we're seeing is that as emodin concentration is increasing, the likelihood that those embryos will not survive is increasing. So we're seeing a line right down the middle of the graph going horizontally at about 50%. So this is where um, we will see 50% mortality. This is what we call a lethal concentration, a median lethal concentration. So we can see where um, that horizontal line intersects those curves, those probability curves, and that will show us what exposure, what dosage of emodin will produce 50% um, mortality. And we see for block two, it's just over one part per million. And for uh, block one, it's right about eight parts per million. Um, so we're not seeing any block effect where one, um, one pairs eggs are more sensitive than the other. They have similar sensitivity, but there is a uh, block by concentration interaction effect. So you're not seeing a difference in the slope, but you're seeing a difference in the concentration exposure that they're re responding to, but they are both responding in a similar way. So next we looked at the malformation rates and we did find a significant effect of increasing um, emoting concentration yielding increasing malformation rates. So again, we have our two blocks, but um, we do see that early on, basically right at 0.1 parts per million, um, you're getting uh, high mortality already. And or, I'm sorry, high malformation rates, uh, too many M words for this hour of the night, um, right, right off the bat. So basically, as soon as they're exposed, we're seeing significant malformation. So now we can look at how this compound impacted um, the, the native species, our chorus frog eggs. And so here we have four blocks, so four sets of breeding pairs offspring, which is why we have four separate curves. And you'll notice that the slope of those curves is not exactly the same. So we did have something of a block effect, which is showing that there's some intraspecific or within species variation in sensitivity to the compound, but we're still seeing that significant effect of increasing emodin concentration, yielding increasing mortality. And so here we can look at where that horizontal line intersects those mortality curves. And for one of the pairs, it's, it's just above 0.1 parts per million. And for the other three pairs, um, it's between one and 10 parts per million that we're getting that median lethal dose. Um, so it is having almost a stronger effect that than we saw in the African clawed frog. We're seeing that the native species is more sensitive than the model species in this case. So next we can look at the malformation rates. And here again, we had a significant positive effect of increasing emodin concentration on the likelihood that these embryos will be malformed. And so, as soon as they're exposed, we already have, um, you could see 0.8 um, for malformation. So that's a proportion of 80% um, likelihood that they will be malformed if exposed to emodin. 
So we didn't have any significant block effect um, across any of the, uh, the four sets of offspring that we examined here. So what does this mean? Well, basically when we have those lethal uh, median concentrations, um, for malformation, we have a similar benchmark that we can look at called EC50, which is effective concentration, uh, median concentration. And so you can take the ratio of that LC50 to the EC50 to get what we call a teratogenicity index. So the teratogenicity index is the likelihood that an organism will have some sort of developmental harm or malformation at doses lower than those that induce mortality of, of these developing embryos. So the higher that index, the more likely it is that um, the frog embryos that are exposed will have malformations. And so here we've calculated the teratogenicity index in this table for the first two um, pairs of uh, African clawed frogs offspring um, in the first two rows of the table. And you see that the teratogenicity index is 2.45, 4.92. And then if we look at the four blocks of uh, the chorus frog, we see that these teratogenicity indices are much higher. So they range from 40 to about 60. So it's a much greater likelihood that they will have malformations um, should they develop beyond uh, basically a stopping point that the teratogenicity causes. Um, so how does that compare to other um, compounds that, that cause embryo development, uh, developmental harm or disruption in amphibians. There have been a lot of compounds, um, mostly anthropogenic compounds, synthesized compounds that have been evaluated for toxicity to amphibians. And so um, for comparison, the uh, herbicide Paraquat uh, has a teratogenicity index of 0.5. And so that's low because it usually induces mortality right off the bat rather than um, inducing lots of malformation. In comparison, in comparison the insecticide Malathion has um, a much higher likelihood of causing malformation to amphibians than, uh, than the herbicide does. But you can see that this compound Emodin is in the middle. These are just two benchmarks to give you a little bit of context. Um, so for African clawed frogs, um, you're likely to see more um, mortality, less malformation. And for um, Sudacris, um, you're seeing this greater sensitivity to the compound with our native African, um, sorry, native chorus frog. Um, so what does this mean? Well, overall, we see that this buckthorn compound, Emodin, has produced effects that disrupt development and induce malformations at all of the concentrations that we examined in both the model species and in our native species. We see that the compound produced total mortality in African clawed frog embryos at concentrations greater than or equal to 50 parts per million. But for our chorus frogs in, in our, our region here, um, it caused embryo mortality at concentrations greater than or equal to 10 parts per million. So as a reminder, the soil immediately surrounding the vernal pool where we had lots of buckthorn sprouts, the concentration in the soil was too parts per million. So again, that was probably 20% of what was there. So you can see that there is this um, potential to cause developmental harm present in the breeding pool environment. So uh, Sudacris, the chorus frogs, had a lower um, lethal median dose and lower um, effective concentration um, for, for malformation than the African clawed frog did, again, indicating greater sensitivity. That teratogenicity index differed. It was much greater for Sudacris, um, the, the chorus frog, than for the model organism, the African clawed frogs. Now, in both of these species, all of the mortality we saw occurred within 96 hours of exposure, but most of it happened within the first 24 hours of exposure. So the cells basically stopped dividing. Um, they don't look like they got um, much past a few hours of development once they were exposed. Um, 
in some of the lower concentrations where they progressed a little bit further than that, malformations were typically visible between 48 hours and 72 hours following exposure. And for both species, we saw that the severity of the malformations actually increased as the concentrations of emodin increase. So we tended to see more malformations and, and more severe malformations. Um, so the most severe malformations and the greatest number of malformations per embryo were seen in the 10 part per million emodin treatment for African clawed frogs and the one part per million treatment for our native chorus frog. So again, that's a lower concentration than what is in the soil surrounding um, the vernal pool with all of those, those dense uh, re-sprouts of buckthorn. Um, so mortality um, occurred within that first 24 hour window and embryos failed to develop in concentrations greater than 10 parts per million for African clawed frogs and greater than one part per million for the chorus frog. So basically it, we wouldn't expect to go out to a pond and see a ton of malformed embryos. You basically go out and expect to see undeveloped embryos, ones that just failed. Um, so this is why it gets a little bit um, sticky to discern when you're in the field trying to look for these conditions because they are so small. Um, and once they've been in the pond, they're going to tend to develop more fungus and molds on them um, if they fail quickly. But um, these are the types of malformations that we saw at various concentrations. So this first um, photo labeled A is a normally developed African clawed frog embryo. This is our control that was in that uh, FETAC solution. And in the second photo, B, we see a, um, uh, basically a sy symmetry malformation um, where you see this kind of C-shaped kink in the developing notochord. They don't have a spine. They're not a full vertebrates at this point. They have a developing notochord. Um, and that happened at 0.1 parts per million. In photo C, we see a malformation that's called wavy tail malformation that kind of looks like um, almost like an N. And that was at 0.5 malformation, um, 0.5 parts per million. I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't talk tonight. Um, that, um, that is also a severe notochord malformation. So basically, they're not going to be able to swim if this is what the notochord looks like if they were to somehow survive to hatching. Um, at one part per million, we start seeing facial asymmetry and spinal kinks at 10 parts per million. We're seeing optic malformations, abdominal edema, and stunted growth and severe asymmetry. Um, so these would not be tadpoles that would survive if they got to the point of hatching. For uh, the chorus frog, this is our native chorus frog. Um, the control embryo is seen in A, so that's a normally developed one. Um, in B, we see the uh, kind of axial malformation, so asymmetry at 0.1 parts per million. Again, we see that kind of N-shaped wavy tail notochord malformation at 0.5 parts per million. At one, we see um, some abdominal malformation, spinal malformation, or excuse me, notochord malformation, and facial asymmetry, and also at one part per million, not 10, but this is, this is at one part per million for our native species. We see abdominal edema, stunted growth, tail malformations, um, and so this is at a lower concentration than the severe uh, malformations that we were seeing in the African clawed frog. So again, the severity of malformations was greatest for 10, uh, 10 parts per million for African clawed frog and one part per million for the chorus frog. So emodin caused stratogenesis, so disruption of development 
and malformation in both the native and our model amphibian um, species at concentrations that are present in these breeding pond environments where buckthorn has invaded. So based on pond water samples, um, the concentrations that we we're finding in the pond water sample, we might expect 10 to 20% of eggs to have some degree of malformation. And based on the concentrations that we were finding in soil and pond substrate samples, we would expect complete teratogenesis, that they just wouldn't develop um, and they wouldn't elongate and they wouldn't start to start looking more tadpole-like. Um, so we see that there is this variation between species in how sensitive they are, and even within species across the different breeding pair, their offspring have different degrees of resistance to it. And that is a phenomenon that is found um, in a lot of toxicology studies, whether um, amphibians are, are being exposed to a natural compound or more often an anthropogenic um, chemical, um, something synthetic in the environment, you see that there is going to be some variation in how sensitive um, they are within populations and even among different populations of the same species. But overall, we're still seeing an effect that this has the ability to disrupt normal development and really impact hatching success overall. We also see that there are multiple delivery routes for the compound. So it can come in from the fruit and the leaves, it can come in from the root system, and it can really um, persist in the soil for some time. And we don't know the absolute longevity of the compound in the environment. It's something we would love to find out, but that, that's a very complex and, and nuanced thing to try to tackle in part because the soil, um, if you sample soil, it's not one material, it's a mix of different parent materials and a mix of organic materials. And there are a lot of things that can bind to the compound in different ways and potentially metabolize the compound in different ways, especially some of the soil microbes. But in terms of its long-term impacts on um, different suites of amphibians, Early breeding amphibians may be some of the most susceptible because they are laying their eggs at the time of year when uh, the buckthorn sprouts are first leafing out and when the re-sprouts are really trying to establish. So they're going to be producing more emodin and releasing it into the soil. And if they're growing right in close proximity to the breeding pond, these are the species that are gonna be more likely to uh, be exposed versus later breeding species that breed in permanent ponds. Now, um, additionally, the position of the eggs within the pond basin may also affect exposure. So I, I drew in that picture some kind of ovals that look like salamander eggs, or I hope they look like salamander eggs, and those were right in contact with the substrate. Um, some species lay their eggs um, up on kind of uh, submerged leaf um, leaves and emergent vegetation right at the air water interface to try to get the most access to oxygen. Other species lay their eggs a bit deeper and that's a mechanism to try to avoid frost damage because certainly in March we all know that uh, here in Illinois the temperature likes to seesaw and we get lots of warm days followed by snow followed by ice so the eggs that are closer to the air water interface tend to get um, hit if we get a sudden layer of skim ice that can cause egg mortality. So the, the species um, trying to avoid that often lay their eggs a little bit deeper and often closer to the leaf litter that might be building up in the pond basin and closer to the substrate. So species like spring peepers lay their eggs on the leaf litter on the bottom of the pond and on the petioles of leaves on the bottom of the pond. So they would potentially have greater exposure than a chorus frog might. Um, in addition to this teratogenesis and malformation, there have been studies of other invasive species like purple loosestrife, um, giant knotweed, uh, Chinese tallow, and some species of cattail that have demonstrated that when amphibian larvae, the tadpoles, try to graze on those different plant materials, they often have reduced larval growth and survival in comparison to how they perform with native species. They're less able to assimilate the nutrients from um, these compounds um, from plants with which they did not evolve. So um, overall, 
we know exposure opportunities are going to vary um, both with timing, again, with placement. Um, I know I talked a little bit about it, but I thought you might like to see some of these uh, critters here. So um, over on the left, we've got the wood frog. This is our earliest breeding species, and they lay these large globose eggs, and they tend to be kind of closer to the air water interface, but on submerged twigs and vegetation. Um, the chorus frog, uh, whose eggs we specifically looked at, it, uh, their eggs are usually closer to the air water interface. Um, the blue spotted salamander, we can see its eggs in those middle photos on the right. They tend to lay individual eggs on the leaf litter on the pond and in little clumps of moss. And that is in closer con um, contact with the pond substrate, similarly for the spring keeper in the upper photo. Um, and then these are the salamander eggs, uh, tiger salamander and spotted salamander egg masses on the bottom. And these are usually um, much closer to that pond substrate. And then in contrast, we've got our leopard frog, um, which breeds a little bit later. They breed usually in late March, early April, and also have these big globose kind of loose eggs, um, but they lay those eggs um, usually fairly submerged, not as close to the air water interface, but not right on the substrate either. Um, so they may be a little bit buffered from the exposure. And then species like toads and green frogs and bullfrogs tend to breed later in the season and tend to use more permanent and semi-permanent bodies of water um, that don't necessarily dry down and tend to have more uh, kind of thick vegetation and duckweed. And those sites tend to be more open canopy and have less buckthorn. So across the regional amphibian suite, the ones that I think are going to have the greatest um, uh, kind of exposure window are the early breeding species that lay eggs on leaf litter um, early in the season, like in March, typically. So with that, you know I've uh, probably talked your ears off. So I wanna thank um, Northern Illinois University where this work was done um, while I was back in graduate school and um, Wes Glisson in the upper photo and um, Annie Ubatuba who is uh, now a veterinarian. Uh, she finished her program at University of Illinois not too long ago. Um, they helped uh, do undergraduate research with um, with me on this program, helping with the soil extractions and the frog husbandry and um, checking thousands and thousands of eggs uh, to ensure that they were developing normally. Um, and this project was funded by Declining Amphibian Population Task Force, Lake County Forest Preserve, and uh, Northern Illinois University. And I also wanna thank Monica Carroll, Melissa Lincheski from NIU's uh, geology department um, who uh, worked with me on the chromatography and extraction work and Leslie Rigg, who is now in Calgary, but um, worked with me on the stem flow and leachate studies. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, I think we're gonna ask the library meeting room first if they had questions and then um... We'll look in the chat. If you wanted to leave your last slide up, um, Allison, that sure. would be fine. Um, the thing we can, they can hear us now. Yes, we hear you, Maria. So far, no questions. All righty. Well, I will look in the chat. I do want to let everybody know that um, while you're thinking of questions, that our next Nature Speaks is on Thursday, January 20th. It's going to be at one o'clock because our speaker is coming from England. We have Dr. Al Dr. Allison Alice Bell. She's the co-director of the UK climate change charity called Possible. And she'll be talking about her book entitled Our Biggest Experiment, The Epic History of Climate Change. So uh, save the date, Thursday, January 20th at one o'clock. If you can't make it, of course, it will be recorded um, just like this program was recorded. So in, in the chat, we have several questions here. Uh, the first being, um, has anybody studied the negative effects of exposure of Imodian and humans? Yeah, um, there have been a number of studies that tend to um, examine different aspects of the compound. So they have looked at at causing cell death, um, specifically testing it on tumor cells. 
Um, but that's a very specific applied um, experimental study, um, not necessarily examining people ingesting the compound and seeing if it does have uh, any sort of cancer preventative properties. Um, typically when they, uh, they're they evaluating kind of the effectiveness of various um, kind of homeopathic um, uses of these compounds, they tend to use zebrafish, um, as one of the model organisms to see if it's going to cause an issue. And so um, the study I recently came across was um, examining the bioaccumulation of emodin in the colon cells of zebrafish embryos because people were ingesting it as an herbal laxative. And so it does have this buildup and causes cell discoloration. But in terms of actually looking at it in humans, um, I, would, I would have to do some digging to see if there were any human test subjects in any of those studies or if it's just kind of looking at human cells in a lab. All right. Another question is, um, are there more studies about Imodian or buckthorn on surrounding plants, seeds, and breeding insects, macroinvertebrates? Um, oh, on macroinvertebrates, I, so, so I haven't seen any on macroinvertebrates yet. Um, it would be a really interesting thing to examine. Um, there had been a study, um, I feel like it was from the, the late 1970s. A lot of initial buckthorn work was done in the 70s and then it's like people stopped looking at it for quite some time. Um, I'm not quite sure why that was, but uh, there was a study interestingly looking at gypsy moth larvae, which are also invasive, but they found um, that it delayed um, larval development when they were feeding directly on it. And it also caused mortality if they were feeding kind of continuously in high concentrations, but usually it just kind of stunted growth in uh, gypsy moth larva. Um, so that is the only study with insects that I can recall um, coming across. All right, and someone wants to know if the drought this year had an effect on the lower levels of water in small ponds and the amphibians. Yes, um, yeah, unfortunately, this, this was an extremely rough year for uh, our regional amphibians. This was probably the driest year since at least 2012. 2012 was also an extremely severe drought. And um, most of the breeding ponds in the region dried in June. And as I mentioned, um, salamanders tend to uh, complete metamorphosis in July. So most of their offspring did not make it out. We did have successful recruitment um, in some spots, uh, some of the deeper ponds, semi-permanent ponds that still held on to like a little um, kind of vanishing puddle of water um, with spring peepers and chorus frogs in places. Um, but uh, actually in one of the hats I wear at the museum is directing our community science program, the Calling Frog Survey. And um, several of our monitors reported from uh, different parts of the Chicago, the Chicago wilderness region that um, in some areas their breeding ponds refilled. And so initially, you know, they started hearing toads call um, around late May and then it got so dry that they stopped and they were hearing some calls in ditches, but not really on their survey routes. And then when the ponds refilled in some places, there was this, this late bout of activity. Um, and in some places there was a little bit of toad and chorus frog recruitment, but um, most of the species uh, had, had a pretty severe reproductive loss this year. Now, one of the great things about many of our regional amphibians is that they can lay thousands of eggs or hundreds of eggs, depending on the species. Um, and so they have the ability to, to have some resilience to drought years. But if you have drought year after drought year after drought year, that's when we start seeing more population level effects accruing depending on how long lived those individual amphibians are. So for species like the cricket frog, which used to be far more widespread in Illinois um, and has largely disappeared from the Northern third of the state, they're still kind of in Southern DuPage and in Will County. Um, 
and uh, parts of Kane County and, and points south of there, um, they have an almost annual life cycle and a very short lifespan. So if you have a severe drought limiting their um, breeding um, success, it's likely that they lose ground unless there's some other site that they can easily colonize from. And because we are in a highly urbanized and fragmented area, the likelihood of that colonization occurring on its own becomes really limited. Okay, there's several questions about how to eradicate buckthorn. So let me um, ask you all these questions and you can address them. We live on a creek. What is the best way to get rid of buckthorn? I want to know how to get rid of buckthorn in my yard and buckthorn has invaded my property and we've been trying to eradicate the old buckthorn with berries first. How can I kill the small saplings in the woods? Yeah, um, one of the things, the challenging things with buckthorn is that it is an uphill battle um, and requires frequent control efforts. Um, you're never really going to have, at least at the, the levels of infestation that we have in our area, where you're not going to have a clearing um, effort that doesn't require frequent control in a couple of years. Um, so typically it's mechanical clearing followed by um, herbicide application. And uh, you can use direct application to the stump um, depending on proximity to water. You should read the label and make sure that you're using any herbicide um, properly and make sure that you're, you're doing it within guidelines of um, proximity to water sources and under conditions when it's not going to have um, basically uh, in effect where it, it won't stay on the stem. So you wanna do stem application with it, um, but you can hand clear um, smaller stems. Um, in terms of the, the mature stems, one of the, the kind of takeaways I found uh, from this work was that the mature stems are putting less of this compound out into the environment in comparison to the re-sprouts. Um, but you usually have to tackle those big stems eventually because they're going to continue to re-sprout. And um, I am also happy to open this up to Dana, who I know does um, far more clearing work than I do, um, if Dana has any suggestions that I've missed. Hello, this is Dana and Agnes here. Um, we were just discussing this. Uh, local residents can reach out to us at info at phnrc.com. And um, we'd be glad to come out and take a look at, at um, what kind of infestation you have. Um, atypically, it, it depends on the site and how bad the infestation is. Uh, but we have all kinds of um, uh, tools and things at our disposal that will help you as homeowners uh, get rid of it and hopefully participate in our uh, uh, Grow It, Don't Mow It program so we can naturalize your lawn. Excellent. All right, somebody also wants to know um, the effect on food crops. Their neighbor has buckthorn growing and the berries drop into their yard and on their grapevines and strawberry plants. That's an interesting question. And um, my thought is because the berries, but at the time that they're falling, they have less emodin in them, that shouldn't be an issue. So really it's the, the, the concentration is greater when the berries are still on the plant and when they're green. Um, so you'll see species like robins that can eat them will start to feed on them as they ripen. And then um, the berries still have some emodin, which make them uh, purgative. So they pass through the gut of the robin very quickly and they tend to kind of um, help perpetuate these really dense thickets of it in, in that process. But um, in terms of effects on, on other you know, uh, food crops, I haven't come across any literature on it other than that buckthorn is um, a host for certain aphids. Um, I haven't seen any literature specific to the, the compound from the fruit 
inhibiting growth of food crops. Um, it's it ten, it's effects tend to be more on competing shrubs that are first trying to germinate rather than things that are already established. Someone would like to know how long it would take seasons for high-risk early laying frogs to completely be gone from the pond. Not long. Um, I mean, it, it depends on, on um, you know, the situation because we if, if you're talking about in context of buckthorn invasion, that can happen fairly quickly. Um, what typically happens is the shrubs are going to take up so much water as they proliferate, you're not going to have a breeding pond left. So that depends on the density of the thicket, really, the depth of the pond, but that could potentially happen within a few years. It would depend on, on the site. Um, but Chorus frogs are, you know, fairly short-lived. Salamanders are more long-lived. So what we tend to find in our area is that you do have these kind of reproductive sink sites where there are species uh, like blue-spotted salamanders that may will migrate there every year, even if there may still be some buckthorn there, and they might lay their eggs and nothing happens, the eggs don't hatch, and they continue doing that and live out their lifespan continuing to do that because um, one of the challenges with amphibians, um, which can be good if you're trying to restore them, but difficult if you're trying to have them avoid a threat, um, is that they have incredibly strong fidelity to the breeding pond that they came from. Um, they use celestial cues to migrate and to navigate on the landscape. And they use kind of light cues as well as the shadows of um, like the profile of the trees at night uh, in order to form a compass and a map of the site. And so they orient themselves in a particular direction when they leave the pond, they know how to get back to the pond. They use olfactory cues um, and can recognize the scent of the pond that they came from. Um, really, they're absolutely incredible species. And so um, if you have a site that keeps getting shrubbed in, yes, it's going to be harder for them to move. And yes, they risk desiccation, but um, they will continue often to go there. And, and there have been studies with amphibians um, in Massachusetts, which um, has implemented a lot of strong state level uh, policies protecting vernal pools um, because there were there were windows of time where there was a lot of development and drainage of these small ponds because they were not connected to navigable water. So under the Clean Water Act, they they don't get protected um, the way larger wetlands might. And so there were places where these ponds were drained or paved over and turned into parking lots, and there were still salamanders migrating from little strips of woodland nearby trying to breed in puddles. Um, in these places. And these are what we call ecological traps. So it's really hard to get them to change that kind of innate navigation behavior. Um, so by trying to do what we can to improve the existing habitat, clear the buckthorn where we can, restore the native plants where we can, and promote their ability to move on the landscape through maintaining corridors and increasing green space, whether that's in our yard or um, working with forest preserves for restoration work days, that's really the best way that, that we can um, try to protect these species. All right, I wanna check again if anybody in the library meeting room has questions, Maria? So far, no. All right, all right, let me check in the chat. I believe you've answered all of the questions. Um, many people said thank you for an informative presentation. I hope we've motivated everybody to try to get rid of some of the buff thorn or all of it in their yards. I know it's a it's a constant battle, but it's worth um, taking on the battle. Certainly, and whether it's for amphibians or you know the bird species, the small mammals, um, and and certainly you know macroinvertebrates was a really interesting suggestion, and I I'm going to talk to some of my colleagues about looking into that further because I I don't think I've come across any any work on that. All righty. Thank you, Allison. And oh, thank, thank you, you everybody.
thank you all for joining us this evening and come back again in January for another Nature Speaks. And hopefully we'll see many of you in October for one of our um, adult programs. Thank you again, Allison, and everybody have a good evening. Have a good night.